Good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome. Thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you for coming to the Inter-University Committee on International Migrations, Myron Wiener Seminar Series on International Migration. I, I, can, I know that I speak on behalf of the other um, steer, members of the steering committee and myself, and I see a couple of them are here, Professor Ueda, Professor Chairman, um, that we're just absolutely delighted to introduce um, our next speaker, Professor Kristen Sirak, who uh, has, you know, an amazing array of accomplishments that I'm going to just briefly give you um, an overview of. So she, Professor Sirak, joined the London School of Economics in 2020 from SOAS at the University of London, where she was a senior lecturer, associate professor of Japanese politics. Her research on international migration, nationalism, and political sociology has been translated into half a dozen languages. Um, in addition to publishing in major academic and intellectual journals, she also writes regularly for popular outlets, including including the London Review of Books, New Statesman, New Left Review, Washington Post. She's author of several, um, uh, her, her um, book, Making Tea, Making Japan, um, Cultural Nationalism and Practice came out in 2003 and re received the Best Book of the Year Award from the American Sociological Association's Asian section. She has been a Richard B. F F F Fisher, a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, a Fun Global Fellow at Princeton University, a Sansbury Farrow at the Sansbury Institute for Japanese Arts and Cultures, and a, a visiting professor at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, as well as a lifetime fellow of Clare Hall at the University of Cambridge. Um, so you can see that she's, we're uh, exceptionally excited to, to have her here with me today. I can say more about her bio, but I, I don't want to take up more time. I will say that with the webinars system, we can't see you. I'm sorry, we can't see the audience members, but we're really delighted that you've taken the time to be here. So please um, to use the chat box. I'm going to be facilitating the question and answer. And on a personal note, I really love Professor Sirak's work, and so I know that I can easily dominate um, the discussion, but I don't want to. So please, at any point in time, put uh, questions in the chat box, and, and we'll definitely get to them. So without further ado, welcome, Professor Sirak. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks so much for having me here. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to join, you know, and be able to do this five hours uh, away as well. And it's especially a pleasure for me to, to be able to be a part of a seminar series that you're organizing because so few people have done real research on this topic that I've been exploring. So it's, it's very nice to kind of connect um, that way as well. So I'm very happy to be here. I've got a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll probably um, move into the share screen mode at this point in time. Um, so that you can see it, is this um, is this visible? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. I'm going to take. All right. So, um, back back in the real world, uh, let me see if uh, hold on. Yeah, here we go. So back in the real world, when we all used to fly, um, I'm I'm kind of curious. I often oftentimes when there's a physically co-present audience, I'll ask if anybody actually has ever done this, flown British Airways, um, because if you have. Um, what's very interesting is in the middle of the in-flight magazine, and this has been the case for years and years now, there's always an advertisement for citizenship um, in, in one of uh, three Caribbean countries. Um, there's also, here's an image um, of the um, departures area at the airport in Antigua, which is a, a country in the Caribbean, has a citizenship by investment program. And you can see at the very top, it's being advertised at the airport right above the immigration booth. So um, you know, if you're thinking about coming back, you can even come back to the island as a citizen. Um, here's an image from Cyprus, where you can see on the left side of the screen um, an advertisement for citizenship for properties that um, can enable you to become a permanent resident or citizen in the country. And driving down the street is a bus with a big um, advertisement on the back, as well in um, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. The Chinese is the only one I can read, but it's actually advertising um, Cypriot passports as, as well. And in fact, thinking about you know, this, this thing of, of citizenship, this, this possibility of buying a property or investing in something and becoming a citizen in a country is a, a part of an, a fairly large industry as well. So there's citizen, there's magazines, there's pamphlets, there's um, citizenship by investment books that are all about this idea of 
becoming an economic citizen, becoming a new citizen in the country simply by gifting money to the government or investing um, in something. There's, I even have the, in the middle, you can see the um, booklet that the, um, the country of St. Kitts don't, gives to all of its new global citizens, where they're offering a, they're delivering a tailor-made solution to your unique immigration needs that's been the focus of our CBI program, Citizenship by Investment, for over three decades. The St. Kitts and Nevis Citizen, that book, take stock of our platinum standard milestones inspired by you as we endeavor to safeguard your deserved piece of paradise. And in fact, there's even whole trade fairs and global hubs around the world where both governments and service providers pitch their citizenship products. And you can visit the booths of various countries and, and learn about the different investment options. Um, here's another one in the Caribbean where you can see the key people running the, the various programs in the Caribbean talking about their concerns in, in managing how citizenship by investment operates. And there's even gala events like the Global Citizen Forum, which was set up in some geodesic domes on the Adriatic coast, where people like Robert De Niro and Cherie Blair, um, Tony Blair's wife, um, go um, uh, come out and proclaim the need for global citizens with entrepreneurial skills that we should all share. So this is the world of citizenship by investment. Um, and it's a world that effectively turns T.H. Marshall on its head. So if you remember T.H. Marshall famously, famously observed 70 years ago in his, his essay, Citizenship and so Social Class, that citizenship is the great equalizer. As he argued, it's a status that over time reaches downward to include ever poorer or excluded classes. So citizenship for T.H. Marshall supplied a modicum of equality within a world of capitalist inequality. But here, by contrast, in the world of citizenship by investment, we find moneyed people leveraging their economic resources basically to escape the limits of their citizenship of birth once it becomes a hindrance. And they do this in order to safeguard themselves as well as their assets and to increase their options. So what, what goes on in this world of citizenship by investment? Now, you know, of course, any sovereign can grant citizenship on whatever grounds the sovereign wants. So for example, um, my colleague at the LSE, Angelina Jolie, has become a citizen of Cambodia based on her environmental work there. Or a, an investment can be a good a reason that, that countries use this too. So for example, New Zealand naturalized the founder of PayPal or one of the founders, Peter Thiel, after he bought some luxury properties and donated to an earthquake relief fund. And he basically wanted, did that so that he could get citizenship so he could um, build an escape pad in, in New Zealand. Um, these are, you know, these are, in, are cases in which it's um, a very highly discretionary grant. It's very typically individualized, um, the basis on, on which um, uh, citizenship is extended. Citizenship by investment that was a little bit different from those kind of discretionary grants. So unlike discretionary grants, citizenship by investments are, are, programs are, are fairly formal. They have very clearly defined price points. They have clearly defined investment types. They have clearly defined timeframes, clearly defined background checks. It's not just cash for passports. There's an extended process that's relatively transparent and formal. Um, you can find this on all of the government websites, for example. Citizenship by investment, which, I, which I'm looking at today, is also different from so-called golden visa programs or immigrant investor visas. So things like in, in the US, there's the EB-5 program, the UK has a tier one investor visa, Portugal and Spain have very well-known options. Because in these investor visas, what's on offer is residence and not citizenship. And even though some, some um, academics have argued about the increasing um, convergence of citizenship and permanent residence, there's still some very important differences between the two. So citizenship is inheritable. You can pass it on to your children, whereas res residence, you can't. Citizenship comes with the possible access to a passport, whereas residence is just a visa in a passport. With citizenship, you can usually sell the investment after three to five years. And of course, you're still a citizen. It's a fairly sticky status that's hard to lose. Whereas with residents, once you sell the investment, the visa goes too. Um, you can move in and out of residence much more easily um, as well. So that's important to keep in mind. I'm focusing mainly on um, citizenship by investment today. And I'll be talking about it based on fieldwork that I've carried out for several years 
um, fortunately most of it before COVID, um, trying to understand how these pro programs operate, not just on paper, but also in practice. So I traveled to 16 countries on four continents um, and, and I attended lots of industry conferences. Um, I did over hundred formal interviews and many more informal interviews with people involved in all sorts of layers of the program, as well as talking to nationals of these, of these countries about what they think about this um, as well. Um, so I'll start off by in, in trying to unpack what this global market in citizenship looks like. Um, I'll start off by um, talking about kind of the supply side and the demand side of these programs. So first I'll do um, supply. Um, where are these programs? So currently there's 15 countries um, in the world operating schemes of some sort. Um, most, I, I tend to focus on ones that have much more formalized programs. I know there's some that kind of are playing in the gray quite a bit where it might be hard to figure out what date the program started or who's in charge of issuing the passports or even in the, in, in the things that, um, uh, um, uh, that Professor Nuri has looked at, um, you, you know, even you know things that are questionable under international law. I, I usually don't include those as formalized programs. So, um, formal programs, um, you know, bring the number down to about twelve right now. You can see that most of these countries are former British colonies, and um, they have common law provisions and something of an offshore industry, and that's usually important in terms of networks and getting the word out. But this is changing too. Um, because there's been the, the spread of programs in the Middle East with um, countries like Turkey and Jordan, and Turkey is really dominating the scene right now. I won't be talking about it, but because um, it's much more recent development, but, but it's been hugely important today. Um, and then there's other cases that that tend to be, as I mentioned, you know, sort of a little bit more in the gray. They lack clarity. They're a little bit more amb ambiguous, um, etc. Um, so I'm focusing really mainly on these formalized programs and. Um, there's a number of countries that are coming on board as well. So Egypt recently passed a provision. Russia and the Marshall Islands have been making noises about starting programs. Armenia and Georgia have been in discussions about this. So it's a trend that's been growing and may be continuing to spread. So if we look at the programs themselves, kind of how do they operate? What goes on within them? Um, what does it take to apply? Here's a list of just some of the, the, um, the provisions um, by country. And these can also change depending on the, the legal format of the programs. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of sort of how it works, um, you know, there's certain sort of investment options, minimum investments, government fees, processing time, um, and physical presence requirements. So in terms of options, Applicants typically invest in approved real estate projects or in a business venture, or else they just donate a specific amount of money to the government. And that usually, the minimum cost usually ranges between about $100,000 to a little bit over 2 million US plus fees. And fees can be quite significant. The whole process, it can take anywhere between two months to about a year to um, approve an application. Usually there's some sort of background checks, checks on the invest that the investment were made, goes through a couple of different um, offices um, within the government as well. Some of the countries though, also interestingly, um, enable you to do this all from overseas. You can swear in, become a citizen at an embassy, um, for, for example, without have, having ever spent any time in the country as well. If you think about demand, um, these pro the the demand is is certainly growing and it's still growing even now. So applications reached nearly ten thousand um, before two thousand and nine, um, and they're even higher today um, because of Turkey. Um, now ten thousand, of course, you know that I know that sounds kind of small, but it's actually quite significant when it's placed in the context of naturalization, which is extraordinarily rare in the first place. Very very few people in the world naturalize. Plus the population of potential buyers is fairly select. So people who are interested in these programs are usually first generation new wealth from the global south. Um, that, and they usually have at least $5 million in liquid assets. Um, and that number is in the ballpark of about 700,000 people. So within that, that population, 10,000 or so is actually much more significant. And it's important to keep in mind as well um, that 
In most cases, family members are added to the applications too. So for every main applicant, there's usually an additional 1.5 people naturalizing as well. So you can you know, multiply those numbers. Um, and from this slide, you can also get a sense of the difference in proportions with the Caribbean options that are much cheaper um, being much more um, popular than the more expensive and somewhat more restrictive um, European options as well. Um, if we look at demand, looking at where people are from, um, you can see that most people who apply, and this is across the world, this is not a, um, a complete slide. Most people who apply in general are from China, followed by Russia and the Middle East. And here you can see how um, different sorts of um, people channel into different places in, in, some, in, in some ways based on their, where they're from. So Russians tend to go for Cyprus. There's been longstanding Russian Cyprus connections. Middle Easterners tend to go to um, St. Lucia, for example. And there can be a number of factors behind these, those patterns. I won't go into too much detail about that today. Um, China, um, I'll, I'll, I, you know, I should explain, doesn't show up in the numbers very well. Um, because, and, and part of that's because countries with a lot of Chinese applicants tend to be reluctant to, to release information. Um, and that's largely because China forbids dual citizenship. So countries that are usually popular among the Chinese are also countries that tend to recognize the diplomatic status of Taiwan rather than China, um, which is the case with St. Kitts, um, for example. And it, you know, it's also one of the reasons why St. Kitts never releases statistics on just who's applying. Um, we can also think of citizenship by investment as a form of long distance citizenship. And that's something that people like David Cook Martin and Yossi Harpaz have written about. That is the people who are naturalizing don't live in the country where they naturalize. In fact, they're not even looking to move there and they might not have even ever been to that country. So you can ask then, why would a wealthy Vietnamese businesswoman want to buy citizenship in say, a country like Antigua? And the answer here isn't tax evasion because most of the people are from places where governments aren't very effective in collecting taxes in the first place, even if, you know, if there is um, a substantial tax infrastructure at all. So it's an, it's an interesting question to think about, um, in part because we typically think of citizenship as being about a bond between a sovereign and a subject. We tend to think about it as the rights citizenship grants within a state. Um, and scholars like Michael Waltzer, Linda Bosniak, Christian Yopka, you know, et cetera, and a lot of their work on citizenship start from that pre premise, as does the big literature on, say, second-class citizenship. So works by people like Peggy Summers and Michelle Alexander, which focuses on the inequalities in access to those rights of citizenship. But citizenship by investment highlights the fact that citizenship supplies benefits outside a country as well. So becoming a citizen of Antigua is not about what it gets you in Antigua, it's about what it gets you in Europe, um, namely visa-free access. And that's what buyers seek, those third country benefits. Um, and my, my research on this, looking at demand, um, has shown that most people are pursuing mobility options in the present. So things like visa-free access to Europe is, is a really big um, motive. Um, and one might also note that this is also true of middle-class long distance naturalizers who, who have the right ancestry that they can apply for European citizens. So people like Argentinians who are lucky enough to have an Italian pass an ancestor will use that to pick up an Italian passport so that they can go and work in London or Paris, for example. Um, so for the, but for the wealthy, future mobility is really important too. That is. Citizenship abroad is often for them an insurance policy against an authoritarian government. It's a plan B. Um, and the wealthy not only have quite a lot to lose, um, they're also typically quite anxious about holding on to their assets for various reasons, especially depending on how they've um, acquired them you know, in the relationship to the government in the first place. And number three, um, people who, who go for these programs are usually interested in accessing business opportunities as well. So depending on where you're from, it can be hard to set up a business in the US, for example. But if you become a citizen of Grenada, you can apply for an E2 treaty trader visa and start a company in Louisiana with no problems and get residence in the US. And it's important to stress here um, that these are the, what people are looking for are almost always third country benefits. 
um, which adds an interesting dimension to the way the market works. And so it means that, you know, for example, citizenship in Malta um, is not about going to Malta and living there usually. It means visa-free access to the US, so it means mobility. It means the opportunity to move to Paris, an escape hatch. And it's also the chance to buy a bank in Austria, for example, you know, business opportunities. And it's important to keep in mind too that people from outside the North Atlantic often can't take these things for granted in the same way that European or American counterparts can. There's a substantial inequality between citizenships as well. And that's one of the reasons for demand too. So, you know, of course though, in, in talking about this, we also need to keep in mind that many buyers are very wealthy in the first place, precisely because they're nationals of say, China or Russia at a particular historical juncture. So it's not as though they're simply completely victims of an unequal world of borders. It's, it's, I think the story is much more complicated than that. And it's precisely this dual system of inequality, both between countries in terms of what citizenship gets you and um, within countries in, between the have and the have, have nots or the have much mores even that creates the demand for citizenship by investment. So if to unpack a little bit more how citizenship works as a commodity, it, it all of this begs this question of how, how it is in the first place that a sovereign function like citizenship can be brought to market. I mean, how, how is it that the state can sell something that is seen as so intrinsically a state right? Something, something that even in international law, there's very little about naturalization procedures for states. There's very little that binds them. Um, so how is it that citizenship can be brought to market? And the story isn't so exactly straightforward as one might, might think. So if we look at the literature on states and markets, we can see that traditionally, states have been seen as setting the rules of play and acting as sort of the guardians against market fallouts. Um, in sort of neo-institutionalist approaches, the state is effectively seen as a market enabler. Um, and you know, here are the work of people like Neil Fligstein, Frank Dobbin, Kieran Healy or so, um, really works within this paradigm. There's also a big literature on neoliberal transformations of the state. So people like David Harvey, Iwa Ong, Wolfgang Streich, they look at how states have ceded control to markets or how the political sphere has become recast or how it's become colonized by market logics. And we do see that to some degree in citizenship by investment too. But neither of these strands, which is you know, looking at the relationship between states and market, neither of them tells us much about how a market in a sovereign prerogative is possible in a first place. And it's an interesting challenge too, because with the, excuse me, with the commodification of sovereign prerogatives, the state is not only the key rule maker of the market, which we know um, from other work, it's also the sole producer of the good. Um, only the state can produce citizenship and have it be legitimate. And this raises questions then about legitimacy and credibility that market actors need to manage because the state is effectively wearing two hats. The state is making the rules of the market and it's producing, it's the only entity that can produce the product. And this challenges conventional assumptions that separating those roles helps mitigate conflicts of interest and helps to stabilize market transactions. So it creates kind of a multiple hat problem. Um, how do states solve this? And here, here I'll sort of intimate the answer that I'll, that I'll get to at the end of sort of a historical examination of the evolution of these programs. But basically what happens is that the state creates a distance between these two roles, between making the rules of, and producing the good by shifting elements of review and of implementation to separate, separate agencies, to external firms, and to other third party actors. So it's no longer just the executive that's you know, dealing with these matters any longer. And what happens then is you get a division of labor on the one hand and the outsourcing of oversight um, to due diligence firms and the like that separates the executive of the state from the operation and the supervision of the program. And this has been crucial to the development of these formal citizenship by investments schemes. And what's interesting too, I'll bring this in a little bit at the end, but flag it here, is that it's, it's also observable in other cases of um, sovereign pr prerogatives going to market, like the, the development of a market in sovereign bonds. There we also find the institutionalization of a div division of labor um, that, that's necessary as the market expands, as well as the involvement of third-party actors 
in order to secure the credibility um, of the market. So, how, you know, like, how do you know you're going to get your money back from a state? Um, you know, because the state has sovereign prerogative around that. There's Moody's and, and Standard and Poor's out there to tell you that you will. Um, so basically, we, we have in these cases, sovereign prerogatives going to market. There's an authority vacuum that, that emerges and third parties move into that in order to facilitate a competitive market around it. Um, and it's interesting to see as this is something that's that's moved in and transformed the global market in citizenship by investment. And we can see from looking at the prehistory of citizenship by investment, what it looks like when this doesn't happen. So if we look at the, the origins of citizenship by investment, the birth of, of CBI, um, you can see it as, as emerging in the early 1980s in Hong Kong. Um, when, and after 1984, when it became clear that the UK was handing over not only the, um, the, the territories on the mainland, but also Hong Kong Island proper, um, there, there became this huge um, sort of rush and concern to try to get um, citizenship uh, somewhere else in order to secure their um, capitalist um, gains and opportunities as well. It was a huge booming market um, with all sorts of stuff going on. There was even a local magazine called The Emigrant that exit advertised various exit options. And within the scene of people looking for exit options, um, countries like Nauru, Vanuatu, Tonga um, began selling citizenship or basically passports. They sold an estimated 14,000 passports for anywhere between about $5,000 to about $50,000 each. But in looking at the scene and, and these, the nature of these sales, they were largely secretive and defined by a lot of ambiguity. So if we look at the Tonga case, um, Tonga revised the law in 1984, which gave the king of Tonga full discretion to naturalize foreigners. What happened? Middlemen opened up shop in Hong Kong and they sold over 8,000 passports outside the knowledge of the Tongan immigration office. And the proceeds of the sales ended up not going into Tonga, but the bank accounts in North America. And there was, there was no formal process, no credibility. And when news got out, there were unprecedented street protests that brought down the prime minister. So it was this sort of kind of shady dealing where it's kind of unclear. One hand of the government doesn't know what the other one's doing. It could just be embassy selling extra passports. Um, there were international criminals showing up at airports with Nauru or Vanuatu do documents. Imelda Marcos even was flying on one. Thousands of passports went missing, et cetera. And, you, you know, the bulk of the sales, there was, you know, a lot of it was really going on in the Pacific, but other countries began following suit. So um, in 1984, St. Kitts added a channel um, in its Citizenship Act is when it got um, independence from Britain. Lesotho in, in Southern Africa started selling citizenship from its consulate in Hong Kong. Be Belize and Grenada opened up discretionary channels until the US pressured them to stop following September 11th. And even Ireland had a fiscal naturalization stream um, that, it, that it ran throughout the, the um, 1990s. However, the government closed it before, um, I, I, in I think it was 1998, um, because there were a lot of problems with fraud and difficult, difficulties in showing the actual economic benefits of the program. And you know, from this quote from a, a, de a debate within the, the Irish Senate, you can get a sense of just how murky the scene kind of was. So um, as one of, one of the um, senators was saying, the scheme was apparently perfectly legal in that it broke no law. But the basis for it was not set down either in the form of legislation or ministerial order. It worked entirely within the scope of the discretion available to the minister of the day. It came into being with an informality that's quite staggering, particularly in view of the importance of the issues involved. There seemed to be no rules governing the scheme at all. So in these early years, um, it, was, it was a fairly murky world a business that involved usually only countries, pretty small countries on the periphery. Um, Ireland might be the arguable exception, but it's also still kind of, you know, on, on the periphery in some ways too. Um, but what's interesting in, in moving beyond this is that the global core would get involved too, but in a slightly different way. So global core countries, wealthy countries in the West, for example, began offering not citizenship, but residence you still had to do the time to get citizenship. So 
Canada really kicked things off when it launched its um, federal immigrant investor program in 1986. And for this, Vancouver was really a hot spot. Um, it completely revamped actually the downtown area of Vancouver as well. Investors could acquire residents in Canada basically by parking their money in the country. Initially, it was just 150,000 um, Canadian. And exchange, in exchange, they would get a conditional residence visa that became permanent residence after three years, and then they could apply for citizenship. And in all of this, um, there was a required application process as it was much more formalized. The banks checked the assets. Government immigration services were involved. There were statistics on it. It was pretty formal. Um, throughout the course of this program, which was hugely, hugely popular, um, the price went up over time. It eventually reached about 800,000 Canadian dollars, um, but banks got involved um, with processing the, the applications and they, they worked out financing as well. So. Um, so the actual price came down in terms of what people really paid. And the result was a hugely, hugely popular program. It produced over 200,000 new Canadians or permanent residents over its history. Um, and you can see these, the change in time in popularity. Um, the, the big drop we see in the 1990s was due to a review of the program, followed by an increase in price and stricter enforcement um, of the rules. And it's also in looking at all these um, uh, issuance, permit issuance data. It's also important to, to realize that sometimes it can take even a couple of years for a country to issue a permit. And sometimes they can do that on a uh, deliberately slow basis, slowing down the numbers who, that are coming in. So it's not an actual reflection of, of demand. Um, but Canada did, you know, did pretty well off of this. And other countries began to take note. So the US followed suit. In 1990, it started its EB-5 in investor program where you invest. Now the price point has gone, gone up, but you know it was for many, many years, you invested 500,000 in the US and you could um, get a green card you know, with a lot of, um, there were a lot of com complexities in terms of how it worked, but that was the basics of the program. The UK had a program, Australia rolled, rolled out a program very, uh, very early on. Now, in fact, almost half the countries of the European Union have these sorts of programs. But what we see um, then, basically, so we've got a set of these sort of discretionary, somewhat dodgy economic citizenship channels in more peripheral countries. And then we have these more formal residents by investment programs in the global core. And it's within the space between the two that we see the emergence of citizenship by investment. So basically what happened is was in 2006, a Swiss wealth planning company called Henley and Partners um, basically borrowed from both, both of those um, sort of types, the discretionary economic citizenship and the immigrant investor visas to create something new. He went down, to, so, so Henley and Partners went down to St. Kitts and suggested how it might expand their discretionary economic citizenship stream into a formal citizenship by investment program. So St. Kitts did have allow, allowing naturalization based on financial contributions, but basically it, the, it was the foreign minister running a law firm that gave a few dozen passports annually to Americans avoiding taxes and sometimes to some drug runners in South America. It was sort of, it's kind of there, but um, the numbers were really small, sometimes even less than a dozen per year. But under the advice of Henley and Partners, the government began to elaborate and standardize the whole process. So it set up a private entity, um, a citizenship investment unit, uh, or set up a private entity, a private fund to manage the funds coming in. It created a system to license service providers who are handling the applications. It created a separate bureaucratic unit, a, a CIU citizenship investment unit to vet the applications and have focused dedicated bureaucrats doing this. And then in the end, all the approvals had to go through the cabinet rather than just be approved by um, the prime minister. And looking over its shoulder at the US, because of course it's third country interests that are very important to this market, the government outsourced its background checks to American due diligence firms. Um, so, 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 so to say that um, you, know, you, you guys should be able to make sure these people are clean. And the US was also not happy about possibilities of money laundering through the program. So St. Kitts established two clear investment possibilities. One would be contributing 250,000 US to a government development fund or purchasing approved real estate worth at least 400,000 US dollars. And in return, you would get citizenship in a couple of months 
plus fees, plus background checks. So the result of all this wasn't exactly cash for passports, but really an extended process with a clear division of labor, clearly defined procedures, clearly defined price points, clearly defined investment options. And this sort of formalization was required for the program to scale up. Then what was very important, so this happened in 2006, 2007. Then in 2009 came the big bonus. St. Kitts got visa-free access to the EU. Which, was, which is valuable for any sort of Russian oligarch or Chinese nouveau riche. You know, so rather than having their passport sit in, you know, if they're traveling across the EU, rather than having their passport sit in embassy after embassy as they're trying to get travel visas, they can just go on a passport from St. Kitts and get in. The government also contracted Henley and Partners to advertise the scheme in exchange for a very nice commission of about $20,000 for every um, application that came in which was a pretty good incentive for Henley and Partners to promote the program. So it, it started a citizenship conference. Um, it bought advertising space in The Economist magazine. It set up international passport rankings. It created a global citizen award and, and founded a global citizen magazine as well. All this stuff, these accoutrements kind of creating um, elements of the market. But most importantly, the firm began promoting the program among personal wealth managers and global banks and major accounting firms. Uh, and these places, you know, which would have a very wealthy clientele looking at, you know, various options for themselves, they could then line, they were already doing, you know, say applications for Canada, but they could now line up St. Kitts citizenship alongside, say, the Canadian or the American options. So in, in this, you know, with all these transformations, citizenship in St. Kitts was no longer a murky venture, but a legitimate option. And importantly, it was one that wouldn't raise warning flags for the risk divisions of these international banks or major, major accountancies or law firms. Um, so in kind of encapsulating this shift, um, a lawyer at a big four accountancy described it um, uh, saying that um, in the early 2000s, a client had asked her about these sorts of options. A client had, had heard about them. She was unfamiliar with it. And so she did a risk analysis and that threw up all sorts of red flags. But the client wanted her to find out more. So she flew to the country um, on a fact finding mission and said she was met by some shady people at the airport, eventually got into a government cabinet meeting, but you know, couldn't really find out much about it. And it didn't didn't seem right to her. Um, she said, nobody could tell me what the scheme was. There was no transparency. I couldn't find out head or tail what was going on and had a bad feeling about it. So she advised her client not to do it. But now actually she does applications all the time. She explained there's been a big shift in the formalization and that's made a difference. So and as she put it, but now when you think about all the transparency and due diligence, we've come a massively long way. All those things that were so wrong then are so good now. Um, and others, you know, who, who work in sort of wealth management would, would describe this as well. So a former banker, 10 or 15 years ago, if a client came in with a St. Kitts passport to open a bank account, no one knew where it was and no, they wouldn't do it. Now all the compliance departments know about it and know where the islands are. Or the, another one who had been involved in the industry for many years said, you know, in the early years, you know, these countries, they didn't have a dedicated team like the CIU, the separate citizenship investment unit vetting the applications. They didn't have a system of licensed agents, but it's all a lot more transparent now. So the effect of this, the effect of creating a division of labor and a transparent process, that had a huge impact on legitimacy. It made citizenship by investment into a scalable product. And here you can see the change in growth. So 2006 was when Henley and Partners went into St. Kitts. And um, if you look at the numbers that are available for the years before that, it's also pretty small in, in almost all years, um, with, with one or two exceptions. But the, you know, the, but you see, we see that the numbers really um, take off from a few dozen of naturalizations in 2006 to over 2,000 um, by 2013. Um, the income from the program in 2006 was about 1% of GDP. Now it's over 30% of St. Kitts GDP. And the receipts that the country gets from the fees alone are greater than the re receipts that the government collects in tax. Um, so unsurprisingly, given especially for very small states, it's a model that sped, spread very quickly in the region. So we can see in 2013, Antigua and Grenada developed similar schemes. In 2014, Dominica, which had a longstanding discretionary channel going back to 1993, it develops a more formalized program along the model used in St. Kitts. 
in 2006, St. Lucia gets on board and they're doing this all in very close interaction with these international service providers do this. We also see that the Mediterranean has become a key center of sales. So Henley and Partners took its model to Malta, which started a program in 2014. Um, the initial plan was to offer citizenship within six months for a single donation of 650,000 euros. But the European Commission began to put pressure on Malta. And there's a bit, a bit of a political backstory to that. So Malta extended the process to one year. It raised the price. And quite importantly, it involved multiple private agents in vetting the applications and hired independent, country, uh, independent companies to carry out background checks. Malta, in, in following this sort of mo model, slightly um, elaborated form of what was developed in the Caribbean, it joined Cyprus, which since 2007 um, revamped, has been revamping its discretionary um, citizenship channel into a more formal channel as well. And it's also been um, acquiescing to pressure from Brussels. Now, the Cypriot case is kind of interesting because it's a case where the power of international service providers has been much less, though it's not non-existent, but it's largely, it's coming from the government, a lot of these reforms. I should also flag that um, as of autumn last year, it's been um, put on hold. The law is still on the books, but um, it's been completely frozen because of um, an expose by um, some journalists from Al Jazeera showing uh, some very high ranking government officials having created basically um, a VIP lane going around the formal program. So I think what's, what's interesting here is that, you know, the for, formal program is still there. It was still vetting applications still there. But if you had a very difficult client with a kind of a shady background, some government officials, you know, kind of created an alternative channel around the program where they would, um, with, through some grease palms, um, still give out citizenship. And that, that's come out. And since then, um, Cyprus has, has launched a big investigation um, of, of these officials. Um, so the result of all of this has been an interlinked global market in citizenship that sees now sees an annual turnover of over four billion U.S. dollars. But it's it was, the development of this market has only been possible once at, it was after the states were able to deal with this multiple hat problem. That is, the, only after they were able to establish an internal division of labor and an, ex, an extended application process. And after they began outsourcing elements of implementation and oversight to third party actors, making it more um, transparent, more trustworthy in the eyes of um, sort of global wealth players. Um, what's interesting is that we see this in, in the cases of other sovereign prerogatives going to market too. So as I mentioned before, if you look at the origins of the market and sovereign debt, it didn't really function. People couldn't really trust the state until joint stock companies stepped in between the state and the buyer in order to formalize the process, certify the deal, and guarantee that the sovereign could be trusted and the money would be repaid. Um, you know, it's why, why we have these, you know, Moody's, for example. Um, we also see the elaboration of an internal um, uh, division of labor, especially in uh, with sovereign sovereign bonds, when sales of sovereign bonds shift from uh, originally sort of backroom deals into competitive markets, and all of this goes on to set this multiple hat program um, pro pro problem. Um, so I'll I'll wrap up by by quickly expanding out with three observations about state behavior in this sort of scene. Um, now, even though states have full discretion over naturalization policies, there's virtually nothing in international law that impinges on, on what's really a domain reserve of the state. What's interesting is that we find states now adjusting their, their citizenship, their naturalization policies to conform to market demands in three key ways. Um, and I'll just quickly add what's interesting too is that countries that, that remain outside of this market that st still are doing more discretionary economic citizenship de de deals like um, Tonga, they don't react to the, this market competition in the same way um, in, uh, and market demands in the same way that that's, we've seen around formal programs. Um, it's the formal programs that, that really where we see state actors begin, beginning to act like market actors. So first we see um, States reacting to competing products, resulting in price wars, for example. So here, here's a recent price war in the Caribbean, um, where we see countries in succession dropping their minimum investment costs 
Um, and here you can see, trace out the minimum investment cost for a family of four. And you can also see this in the competition between Cyprus and Malta, how Cyprus has been curating a price drop in response to Malta entering the market as well. Um, we also see states responding to purchaser preference. So for example, allowing more family members to be included on the application, allowing, you know, uh, dependent children used to be 18 years old, then they're 22, 26. Some countries consider 30 year olds to be dependent children. We see parents of, of applicants being able to come on. So, um, you know, at first it was dependent grandparents. Now the dependent parents can be 50 years old, for example. Um, uh, but I think what's what's really interesting as well is that we see um, states not only reacting to purchaser preferences in this way, but states giving concession to third countries and supranational organizations like the EU, even though they're not legally bound to do so at all. So, you know, in the case of Malta, Malta acquiesced to the EU to EU pressure, even though legally there's nothing the EU can do against Malta for its citizenship by investment program. However, if we think about the nature of the way citizenship is operating in this market, it's not too terribly surprising because citizenship is not only about the rights you get within your country, which is how we usually think about it, the bond between a sovereign and subject, but citizenship also, also secures rights outside of a country, in third countries, um, usually established through, through treaties, so visa-free access, business opportunities and the like. And it's in citizenship by investment that this external value of citizenship is usually seek. So the effect of this gives external states a great deal of power over what is at heart a sovereign prerogative. And that's why even if a measure of legitimacy has been achieved, one that's enough for actors in the market for it to work, it still can't be taken for granted by those involved in, in its sale. So even if a market in citizenship has become routinized and, become, and continues to expand, as we see with places like Turkey, Jordan, Montenegro coming on board, its future still hangs on these inequalities in power between states. So I'll wrap up there um, and open things up. Uh, and I'll stop my screen share as well. Great, thank you. That was a tour de force. I have um, so many questions that I've typed up, but we also have already questions from the audience. Um, I also, uh, Professor Weda and Professor Terman, who are uh, other members of the steering committee might join um, in. I mean, they're here. I don't know if they, they might intervene and ask a question too. I think, you know, what's so fascinating about your approach um, is that the dominant narrative, our understanding is, this is just high net worth individuals looking for tax evasion. And I think you show on both the supply side and in the demand side very effectively how that's not really the story we're, we're we're seeing and that it's actually a lot more political than than economic. And um, I think that uh, one of the, th there's also a really interesting way that you're working with time in this this argument that I found fascinating. So I, I have like a couple of different threads that I'll, I'll bring up as we, as we discuss on some of the analytical side. But I, I do also want to first um, privilege the audience question. So Vinet Sharma, thank you, Vinet. You gave us four questions. So we're, we'll, um, I'll try to combine a few of these. And so he, he's asking, or she's asking, sorry, I'm not sure. How is citizenship and purchasing it as a commodity leading to lowering the quality of education and institutions are, as wealthy are, um, are using this to like move up the hierarchy? So um, but, but kind of getting to the questions of um, how this may in exacerb exacerbate inequalities. Um, another question that um, is how is citizenship a cause of economic crises as lots of immigrants take jobs away from residents leading to dissatisfaction and frustration among natural citizens? So perhaps one way of answering that would be to kind of come back to these ideas of um, scarcity and managing scarcity and how this leads to and to, um, you know kind of competition. Um, the uh, next question um, is, there is a perception that citizenship policies are leading to issues of inequality, money laundering, and innovation uh, being negatively impacted, as um, such as affluent citizens indulge in round tripping and using political lobbies to run the system for them than rather for, for the masses. And then finally, is citizenship as a commodity causing erosion of democracy, capitalism, and also the rise of populism and nationalism, which is leading to authoritarian leaders. So I think all of these questions kind of point to inequality relationship with the host society, um, and then also some of the, the, the political out, outcomes. I, I see that we have other questions, but that's probably 
enough for the first round? Uh, what do you think? That sounds good. Yeah. Um, so I think I think it's what's important to keep in mind with this is that in the vast majority of cases, the new citizens don't go to these countries. Um, and if they do, oftentimes the countries kind of want it because they've got a lot of money and they can spend it. Um, so especially for the Caribbean countries, these are small countries dominated by tourism. And especially, you know, they have to import everything. Um, they get a lot of cruise ships, which are also terrible for economies because people aren't on the island spending stuff. So they're like, yeah, come. We want our investor citizens to be our best new, you know, like tourist citizens, like come, come and spend time here. Most of the time they don't. Um, you know, they'd rather be in Dubai or London or, you, you know, any, any one of a, a global hub. Um, so that, I think that's a, the, one of the important things to keep in mind, um, that it's not citizenship in terms of immigration. It's completely um, de-linked from Im immigration. Um, so that means that in terms of um, inequality, I, it's an interesting question. It's sort of hard to quantify in these cases. Um, one could say that, you know, in a lot of these countries, there's capital controls. So getting money out in order to um, buy citizenship elsewhere can be illegal, um, just getting the money out of the country. Um, but if you look at the amount of money, you know, that's gone out of China or gone out of Russia um, in comparison to what it, what it costs to do these programs, this is a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. Um, it's not really exacerbating inequality at, at that, in that sort of form. Um, in terms of the, the receiving countries, you can ask questions about how the money is being reinvested in, into the country, how it's being used. Some of them do use it for scholarships and you know, you know, school buses and things like that. Not all the money is as well spent as it could be. And you know, that, that's a whole nother um, set of issues about you know, are these programs really structured and doing what they should do in terms of development. Um, but, and, and then finally, this, this question around um, democracy and populism. Um, what's interesting here is, um, the, and round tripping, I mean, round tripping is something different. Round tripping often happens to investment in companies, so it's slightly different in this case. Um, but um, so citizenship by investment so far, these are pretty small countries on the periphery. And with the exception of Turkey, where it's, you know, becoming big, but Turkey is a huge country. So the number of naturalizations is still a drop in the bucket for, for Turkey. Um, I don't think there, it's really, you know, impact, you know, the, the effect on the major democracies in the world is, is zilch. And, you know, the undermining of democratic participation is going on anyways. Look at voter turnout in the U.S. Look at, you know, oligarchy in the U.S. And the U.S. is not, doesn't have a citizenship by investment program. So I don't think it explains that much in terms of general, you know, global trends in citizenship. But I think it's an interesting sub area. Um, that, that can illuminate a lot of really interesting dynamics. Absolutely, and I think that it, it comes back to inequality in the way that you've connected it to Marshall, right? That this is, uh, I thought you, you said it very nicely when you said it turns Marshall on its head, um, where, which you, you, we think of citizenship as supplying a modicum of equality in a world of capitalist inequality, as you said, and now well, this is kind of um, turning it on its head. So this question about um, the political regime type politics, um, I think it, for me it was very striking when you showed China, Russia, um, uh, Middle East, that, that um, perhaps the demand for this is less about, as you put it, tax evasion. These, these might not be countries where we see these robust tax systems or, or uh, large amounts of extraction of income in that way. Um, but it might be a, a kind of indication of, uh, you know, Hirschman's exit voice. Like, is this, does this, um, does this demand actually point to um, a regime type question of potentially there's greater demand for these kinds of passports in from autocratic or authoritarian states? Um, I'm, I'm been told to speak up, so I hope you can hear me a little bit better. I've got closer. Okay. Um, and so that kind of connects to a, a different question we have from an audience member. Um, Azamat Murzalev, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, asks, in what extent do sanctions of US and the EU against Russia and Iran affect this, these programs? That's a very good question. I think it's, it's also an interesting one because, you know, also, you know, has, has come up already that kind of the media portrayal in the West does focus on, you know, the few cases, I mean, there are some bad apples who have gone through, and they, those tend to get a lot, of the, the, a lot of the press, but very often it's forgotten how difficult it is to travel or to do business 
if you're a citizen of any number of countries. Um, so if you're a citizen of Pakistan, you get visa-free access to about 30 countries. If you're a citizen of Japan, you get visa-free access to 180, which is a big difference, you, you know, like um, it's a huge difference in terms of what you can do. And definitely the sanctions, this has been, um, uh, it's shifting because the US is putting more and more pressure on these countries in terms of um, blocking the, the possibilities to, um, to use them as sanction workarounds. But that certainly has been uh, traditionally a big reason for demand. Um, you, you know, so for example, if you're a business person from Egypt, doing business with Israel can be easier if you're doing it via Cyprus. Um, simply because of the geopolitics of the region. Um, and I think that your comment comes back to this, the point of these third country actors, right? That we don't, this isn't just a question at stake sometimes, it's not necessarily where you're purchasing the passport from, but um, being able to access, as you put it, the EU um, or uh, the US. And so I thought that that was so fascinating and, and a dimension that I really haven't seen. And, and your response to this last question also, um, about these passport rankings and how uh, it reminds us, I think, you know, there's often this narrative of um, in international relations, this is an anarchic world system. And I think that what your work helps show is that it's not anarchic, it's it's hierarchical. And mm -hmm. and um, there's, there's an, an entire political economy that emerges around the fact that mobility is highly unequal. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I do wanna encourage other, um, if there are questions from the audience, Please keep, please keep asking them. I don't see any. Yeah, so I can also answer your the the first one that you mentioned with the Hirschman and the regime type. Yeah, yeah, um, that's there are questions coming up too, because um, that's also been an interesting development too, especially post COVID. Wow. So American passport used to be pretty good. Now, of course, American citizens have to pay taxes on their assets globally, which, if you're very wealthy, is very much a concern. Um, most people who do naturalize, who are wealthy, who do naturalize as American citizens, structure their wealth before they do that in order to protect it from the tax man. Um, but what's been interesting since COVID is that travel on an American passport is now really hard. I think there's about 80 countries that you can go to. Last time I looked, and that was about a month ago. Um, that might have changed. Um, and so there's been a huge interest by Americans in looking at these options. There's long been an interest by expat Americans who've, you know, they've shifted their life overseas and it's a real hassle to be American overseas, um, in part because banks don't like to bank Americans because there's all sorts of background checks that have to go on because of because of the tax system. Um, and it can it can become a real hassle in other sorts of ways. I've, al I've also met people who, who, you know, do like an engineer who works in Central Africa said that it's actually safer for him to travel on a um, a passport from the Caribbean than on a US passport simply because of this geopolitical level. And so, yeah, for me, this is this is what's really fascinating, the way that, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, the inequalities are just not the straightforward inequalities that we usually see. There's all sorts of power inequalities, wealth inequalities, hierarchical inequalities that are striated across, you know, these fields that, um, that get illuminated in the scene. And monetized, right? It's that that's where these, it, it, what I think is fascinating about these programs is it wouldn't make sense if mobility was equal. Like that, that what we're capturing, what we're monetizing is, is precisely the differences um, in, in inequality that are global. And I think that your, your um, explanation of the role of Henley and Partners is fascinating. And I know, I mean, I've, you know, you can see that they're big in this space, but I think what you've shown is, you know, how key they were to um, institutionalizing this this um, this market um, and and uh, and making it something that could be monetized. Um, so again, I don't see questions. I'm going to ask. <laughs> I'm going to be selfish and ask a bunch of questions. I can I can hold on real quick too because yeah. one of the things I also found that's interesting. Oh, I'll, I'll just just real quick. Um, is that the, the opinions of people in different countries about this, what locals, residents in these countries would think about it. And I would always ask, you know, I you know, never spent you know, months, I'm not a proper uh, you know, anthropologist in all of this, but in a place like St. Kitts, um, 19 out of 20 locals whom I spoke to were okay with selling citizenship. They might've thought that it's a very highly politicized, like there's, you know, they might've thought the present government was doing a great job and the previous government did a terrible job or the previous government did a great job, the president, government did a terrible job, but I was really struck that the idea of selling citizenship, they were like, yeah, 
you know, they, and they might also ask, you know, I want to see more money going to, you know, the stuff that I'm working in, I want to see more money going here. Um, no, so it's not that they weren't, um, you know, critical of aspects of it, but they were like, you know, what else can we do? <laughs> you know, um, we don't have a lot of options. And when when countries like the U.S. Um, would criticize it, and there was while while I was doing field work, um, sixty Minutes came out with a highly critical thing on that. People from St. Kitts were like, the U.S. is just jealous because they have their own program. They knew about the U.S. Uh, investor visa program, and they were like, they're just jealous and trying to shut down our thing. Um, so it's interesting, and this varied country to country. In some countries, people were like, in Montenegro, people were like, oh my God, the government is doing this. It's so corrupt. And I was like, all across the case. So it varies. But I think it's also, but it's also interesting, um, the different sort of attitudes that, that, that came up as well, which is, you don't really usually get in the literature on this. Yeah, no, I, not at all. Um, that's why I'm, I'm really excited for your book to, to come out. I can't wait to, to really dig in. Um, and also its scope, you know, the massive scope that you have. Um, so we have a, a perfect uh, a connection to your previous statement on St. Kitts. We have a question from Louise Druken. And Louise was one of the founders of this Inter-University Committee for International Migration. So thank you, Louise. We're happy you're in the audience. So she asked, I wonder what the income in other countries is considering St. Kitts is, you know, 30% of the budget. Um, and that actually, um, if I may just add one line to that, it, um, one thing that I, when I heard that about St. Kitts is, you know, this is now a major source of public funding. How does that influence the politics um, that this money is kind of coming from outside? And I ask this coming from a perspective of working on the Middle East where we have this really robust literature on oil states and this idea of raw tier states that the money is, you know, um, from these oil companies is coming externally. So states are not extracting this income through taxation from their citizens. And that this leads to political effects of not being accountable or buying out or leading to repression, et cetera. And so, yeah, I, I'm really, I like this question. I love this question by Louise because it gets to this question of this lot of money going into public budget. So what are some of the, you know, um, what is it? It look like in other countries other than St. Kitts and Nevis? Um, and um, I add, uh, what are some of the potential political effects of this? That is a really interesting question. Um, so St. Kitts and Nevis do pretty big numbers and it's a pretty small place. So the population is 55,000, <laughs> which is, you, you know, I'm from a, I'm from a, like a college town. 55,000 is the population of the entire country. Wow. Yeah, so you can imagine it doesn't take a lot <laughs> to, to make a difference, yeah. but they're also doing the, in terms of main application. So multiply by say two, you know, add you know, so it's about two point five people per application. They're also doing over a thousand applications a year. Interesting. Um, so um, it, it's also all of these countries have large emigrant populations um, in the Caribbean, whether they're in New York or London. And there's also a lot of intra-Caribbean mobility as well. So the populations also have a lot of people lit from other parts of the island. So thinking, that's an, I think, important mobility aspect of all this to keep in mind. So all of these countries, you know, most of them, Antigua is like, I think about 100,000, Grenada is about 200,000. Um, it's a smaller portion of the budget, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 20%. 20 um, so it's still pretty, still pretty big. Uh, Malta, Cyprus, I think Malta, it's around 4%, much smaller. It's a, it's a bigger country, it's a wealthier country. Cyprus also much smaller, but still it, it, I think the real question is how it's coming in. So it comes in, it kind of looks like foreign direct investment. And I've done a little bit of work on the golden passport programs in Europe. Um, so get residents in those countries where, where the numbers are, are pretty good across cases. And if you look at it as a proportion of foreign direct investment, it can be as high as 15% in some countries, um, which are much larger countries. I mean, they've got populations of millions, um, un, you know, unlike all of these, or it's, it's all except for Turkey and, and these new newcomers, they're all populations of a hundred, you know, of, of under a million in the first place. This question about rentier states and how it gets spent is really interesting. Um, as you might imagine, it's really hard to get information on this sort of stuff. So you can go online and look at like government budget stuff and look at revenue and try to get a sense, um, but it's really tricky. Um, in part because it's kind of unclear 
where all of the money goes. So um, it is a really interesting question in, in that sense. What's also, but in the Caribbean, it's also politics are really vibrant. Like people are, you know, really into politics and talk politics and all that. So it's not like, and there have, in all of these places, there's been a turnover in, in, in power. Governments will often campaign against the program during their, their, their election campaign, but then they always keep it. You know, all, so, um, uh, you know, so in, in that sense, it doesn't seem to be, in, you, you know, they haven't created rentier, you know, like monarchy style rentier. Yeah, style. Yeah. Although thinking about it through that lens, I think is interesting. Yeah, but maybe the Middle East, I'm constantly thinking of that. And um, I guess I also, we saw, it seemed like there was an uptake in for Saudi Arabian consumers at, at, at this time when um, MBS came into power and there was, you know, mm -hmm. so like, so it, there's a really, I think there, the political dimensions of this market are so fascinating and you're, you're really um, pushing us to think in, in, in new ways and, and I, I appreciate that. So I have more questions, but there are actually, we have more questions from the audience. So I'll go to them. Um, Vinette, because we've had four from you already, I'm going to go to the, the two others that haven't um, had a chance to. So Andre asked, how different is the Singapore situation from Hong Kong? Um, so, uh, if you can speak to that, uh, um, I'm not sure if you, that, you can that's with that. that sense, but maybe we need some uh, clarification. And then um, from Vivian, she says, hi, Kristen, thank you for a very interesting seminar. It's a niche field of migration research and it's very intriguing to learn about it today. Would you be able to talk more about the emerging countries interested in entering this market? Consider, considering many island states do not much, have much industry, so this is a good source of income. Why are countries like Armenia also talking about this? There are, are there more reasons than emigration? So a great question. I think it kind of connects to what we were just talking about. So let's um, give you a chance to, to respond to those two. So thinking about, so Singapore and Hong Kong, um, pretty different to be honest because Singapore is pretty um, doesn't have the threat of being taken over by a communist government mm. uh, and, and a timeline for doing so yeah. um, so in that sense you know both of them are, are were sort of big capitalist you know city states um, in you know East Asia Southeast Asia um, but it, it was really after 1984 when people in Hong Kong began to panic. And that's not quite the same thing in Singapore where uh, they were panicking because especially at that point in time, China was way more communist than it is now. And I think even now there's still, it kind of depends, you, you still have to watch where you are vis-a-vis -vis Beijing um, in terms of what you're doing. Whereas Singapore is also obviously, you know, not exactly, uh, you know, terribly democratic. Um, but I think the, the legal protections around capital are much, much stronger, so people are much less panicked. Um, and um, also the, the foreign currency controls, um, like Hong Kong has, long, has for a long time operated as the way that the channel for money to get out of China. Um, and, you know, Hong Kong doesn't have to worry about that. And now that's becoming much more difficult in, in Hong Kong, or, or Singapore doesn't have to worry about that. And now that's becoming much more difficult in, in Hong Kong as well. So even now, like since the umbrella movement and the more recent protests in Hong Kong, there's been huge demand in people looking for more options to get out. Um, in thinking about the, yeah, the, these countries that are in discussion, um, it is interesting, uh, you know, what are the next ones? You know, obviously for service providers, um, they, they can make a lot of money off of it. Their fees are really good. Um, people don't like you know, filling out paperwork for this stuff. And if you're really wealthy, it's really complicated. And some of these, the application files are this thick. You know, if a country's really taking it, um, you know, seriously and has one of these formal programs. Um, so, uh, you know, these service providers make loads. And so they definitely want countries to start programs and they want them to be, they, themselves to be, a, you know, whatever, they want control on who can be a service provider so that they might be able to, to claim that themselves. And ideally, they want this sort of concessionaire status, which Henley and Partners invented of getting 10% um, of all the receipts coming in in exchange for advertising, helping to manage and, and doing those sorts of things. That's not nearly as common anymore. And most, most countries that are have a population of above a million don't do it. They're like, no, we're a state, we can do that ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the service providers are definitely key in pushing this as, as an option. I think Armenia, um, because they've had a change in government, it's probably off the table, I would imagine. Um, but they were in the previous government in, in discussions about it. Thank you. So I, I think that this question of the service providers and the role they play is actually kind of connected to, um, we have an, a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, what is the risk of this kind of citizenship for, for you know, financing acts of terrorism, for example? Um, are, there, um, uh, are there security risks um, associated? I mean, because I mean, the question is about financing. I think in general, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I mean, most of the stuff around moving money, you can do without citizenship. Like if you want to evade, avoid taxes, if you want to round trip, if you want to, you know, set up off, you know, completely complex offshore companies that have no, nobody's liable for them in the end, you can do that all without the citizenship stuff, you know? And in fact, if you needed the citizenship stuff, the numbers would be through the roof because <laughs> there's way more demand for that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of, you know, but if you want to ask, like, for example, one thing I've, I, I always wondered was like, you know, all, in all the terrorist incidences that have gone on since say 2015, nobody has been on any of these passports. And if that were to happen, like, boom, the, you know, they would be shut down, you know, by, by the US, by Canada, by, by the EU immediately. Um, and, and it's interesting, I think part of it is because it's easier to get visas through other channels because these programs usually have background checks of some sort. Um, you, you know, get a student visa. If you want to get into the US for whatever, get a student visa, easy peasy. Um, you know, so um, th that's, that's why I think, you know, it's sort of, um, uh, you, you know, and a lot of people who work in this industry are also, have also been like, yeah, one terrorist act could just destroy us all. Yeah. But it, it's, you know, I think it, it hasn't happened. I think because the due, the due diligence is, you know, more present than it is in, in most, um, uh, mobile, you, know, you know, ways that people look for mobility across borders. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, and I think actually that response really makes me think of this narrative of like refugees posing a terrorist threat, whereas when you look at you know, what actual refugees status determination looks like, the amount of paperwork and time, yeah. there's so, so many easier ways, like you said, on a tourist visa or, you know, to, to be able, uh, these, these, but they're, but it's interesting because I think that precisely these are the kinds of programs that we get, we kind of point to and say, could, could there be kind of black market going on here? Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, the supply side and mm -hmm. and what is being well, well two questions one is kind of a comment i really like i really appreciate the way that you're using time um you know i think that when you were distinguishing between the citizenship by investment programs and the residency you said these these make people still have to do their time they still have to, to sort of be be present so there's a there's a question i think what's fascinating about this market is it's very much about speeding up time that it takes um, speeding up the 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 all of the legwork that has to be done before you travel um, and and monetizing that and showing how people are willing to actually pay those premiums and I think of kind of a parallel market with these um, visa processing centers that have now become really. Um, you know, I know about them because with a Bahraini passport, you need a visa to go anywhere. And so, you know, often it's these third parties now that are taking our fingerprints to, and, and um, taking a cut from both the state and the, the individual in order to process these visas. So I think what's, you know, you're looking at between the citizenship by investment, um, the, the investor visas, and then these kinds of um, uh, visa uh, uh, application third party centers. There's a whole there's a whole industry here that's about speeding up um, mm -hmm. mobility. And um, but you also use it in a really interesting way when you were um, giving us those quotes from the bankers, for example, about how it, there seems to be a particular moment in time where the institutionalization of this of this. Um, um, market makes it so that more actors can enter and it's see it. so uh, lots of interesting that's more of a comment lots of interesting ways that, that you're using time that I really appreciated um, and then the question is now thinking of the supply side 
So mm -hmm. we understand the incentives, um, you know, states make, make an income out of having these higher mobility scores because they can sell these passwords. How do they get higher mobility scores? Is there, do you see that the states that are selling passports are now, for example, investing um, time and, and effort on a diplomatic side to open up these visa waivers? What, what's happening with these visa waivers? Are these like quid pro quos with other agreements? Um, it seems to me like this opens up a whole reign um, of, of, you know, mobility diplomacy <laughs> um, that, that emerges in, in order to increase the international value of your national identity <laughs> documents. Absolutely. Um, and they do. And I have documented that a little bit, that the countries do, you can trace this st statistically, that countries with citizenship by investment programs statistically are more likely to raise in these rankings than other countries. And that it is because they do go around, they know these rankings are, they're very aware of them. Um, and, you know, competing against each other, they'll say, oh yeah, we've got X number of, of countries for sure. No, of course, most people don't care about visa-free access to um, Papua New Guinea or, you know, um, French Guiana or, you, you know, you know, whatever, um, Mauritius, but they're kind of easy to get. So, you, you know, so these countries do, the, the prime ministers often when they go abroad, they do use this now as a possibility for talking to the other heads of state and trying to get visa free access. Um, so we have, th thank you for that. We have a, a, two more questions from Bennett. He's, um, or she is uh, uh, still engaging. I, I want to encourage anyone else. We still have, you know, about 10 minutes. So if anyone else wants to ask some questions, please jump in. Um, so do you feel that regulation should be framed so that citizenship does lead to transparency and legal capital flows moving around countries? And then the second question, uh, there are small countries being um, talked about in the present station. So do these countries um, not have local rebellion towards policies of citizenship as it leads to the erosion of sovereignty? So you said a little bit about that in St. Kitts and Nevis, but and maybe if there's any um, other other examples. So yeah. transparency and then um, local opposition. I mean, I do think if a country is going to have this program, these sorts of programs, a transparent, you know, policy that that does the most to make sure that the money coming in is being used to develop the country is certainly the way to go. And I think in a lot of these countries, that's a big challenge. And you see, it's the same sort of challenge of, of foreign aid, of building the economy and, and all of that. Those sorts of challenges are there in the same way with citizenship by investment. Um, I think, uh, you, you, you know, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges in, in you know, making these, you know, sorts of things work. But if they do, then, you know, hey, um, yeah. it, 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 the question that I was often, you know, asked in the Caribbean, what, are, what other options do we have? Um, in terms of local rebellion or say um, protest against um, the programs, it, it kind of depends. Usually there's more hesitance before they get started and right after they get started. Usually they're heavily politicized. So depending on, and people in the, especially in the Caribbean, they were really frank about this. You know, I hate the program because I support the opposite opposition party. And they would say, but you know, if, if my party, you know, and they would be really frank about this. Um, uh, and in, in, term, in Malta, it became super highly politicized. Yeah. Um, and that has to do with the nature of um, the, pro, the, way, the way the program was implemented and the electoral politics there. So it came in, right after the opposition party who, that had been in opposition for almost two decades straight got into power. Um, and so this became the immediate bone of contention with the former party in power. It was taken um, up to the level of, of Brussels. So it was kind of, it's, it's, it's an interesting um, transformation it was taken outside to Europe as a way to leverage what was going on in the country. If you look at public opinion polls from that time, people who are longstanding, it was the Labour Party, par party who got into power, people who are longstanding Labour Party supporters something like 80% supported citizenship by investment. If they were longstanding Nationalist Party supporters, the, the, the party that lost the election and didn't start the program, it was something like they supported it like only 5%. So it was, you know, it was totally divided along party lines in terms of support. Um, Cyprus more recently, especially since all this revelation, um, uh, all these revelations have come out via Al Jazeera, um, there's been a lot more um, sort of public resistance, public protest 
around it. When I was in Cyprus, which was like three year, two, three years ago, I didn't encounter that much, to be honest. Um, you know, I didn't, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I didn't talk to too many people out on the streets. It was an election year. It was not an election issue. Um, and Cyprus has had, you know, the, I mean, what's interesting in Cyprus is that it was started by a communist party. And it's since, I know, it's since then, you know, the government has been run by more sort of center right kind of technocratic party. It's been continued on across the parties, like the politicians, you know, at that party level, they don't have an issue. And there's about seven major parties in Cyprus as well. Um, but I think now because of corruption concerns around corruption, it, it has become uh, much more um, a, a site of protest within the country. Um, when I was in Vanuatu, um, which also it's kind of it's got kind of a fuzzy-ish program. Um, a lot, you know, people I would ask, some of them would say, "Why would anybody want to buy our citizenship?" They all thought I was Australian, and they would be like, "No, I want. Can you marry me? I want your citizenship." <laughs> you know, so it's also indicative that you know, especially countries that aren't, you know, in those top citizenship rankings, people are much more instrumental. Um, and we see this across the class spectrum, you know, so the research on long distance citizens using ancestry options, who are middle class, they also tend to have, often tend to be instrumental about their citizen, citizenship. Um, and so, you know, and th that's also very racialized on top of it too. So who, who in Chile and Argentina is able to get an EU passport? It's the white, you know, people with white ancestry who can do it. And so wealthy, pe you know, wealthy people who don't have that look for other options um, around it. So, um, oh, okay, great. I, I had another question, but we have one from the audience. So let's take this also from an anonymous attendee. Can you talk more about Alt Malta? Obviously they're an out outlier because they're an EU member state and they fa face a lot of pressure from the EU about this. Their government seems to publish the name of the naturalized investors too for public scrutiny. Um, how would this affect the citizenship by investment scheme going forward in EU member states since Cyprus is on track to becoming an EU member state too. Cyprus is, is an EU member state. So Cyprus, I think joined the EU, and if I remember like 2004 or something like that. So it's in the EU. It's not in Schengen, um, but it's in the EU. Uh, yeah, Malta publishes the names. It does it in alphabetical order by the first name. So it's kind of confusing. On purpose probably to make it really hard to find. And they didn't, and they didn't want to publish it initially. Um, this has been a bone of contention. Um, and there's also issues around privacy as well. Um, you know, if um, you know, should should others have the right to to scrutinize this? Um, Dominique, I, I think Saint Lucia might publish names in its National Gazette only. So you have to go to Saint Lucia to the place in the Parliament building where they store this information. And you can get it. Dominica has kind of you know ish ish um, sometimes done it. Um, so. Yeah, so I mean, what's happened what, what that, What's happened right now in the status of Malta and Cyprus, Malta started off with a cap of 1800 applications. They've reached that cap and now they're revamping things. So right now they're not doing any applications but they plan to reopen. Um, and Cyprus, as I mentioned before, because the exposure of these scandals of people going around the programs through, um, through greasing palms of politicians um, is, is on hold. So it's a, bit, it's a bit unclear, but Cyprus is a member of the EU which is why people want the citizenship. Um, I, I wanted to ask, because you've done so many interviews with, if I'm understanding correctly, I mean, you, you basically look at the whole market, right? The brokers, the suppliers, the demand side. And so from the demand side, does it, I, I realize that these programs are quite expensive. Does it feel like there really are the ultra wealthy who are making these decisions? Or do you feel like people who are kind of middle class, maybe kind of considering this investment alongside other ways of thinking about their social mobility. And I'll give you an anecdote from um, a, a, a research I was doing in the UAE where I was talking to an individual who um, is born in the UAE, his family migrated 1971, right when the union was formed from Iran and never received Emirati passports or citizenship, and but were able to use the father's side of the family to through networks to get Iranian passports. And over time, it's gotten exceedingly difficult to renew their visas with Iranian passports living in the UAE because of the political situation. And mm -hmm. so um, they're not super wealthy, but there was a decision to 
let's take all our savings and buy passports from Dominica so that we can continue to live in the UAE as, as, as residents. And so, I, I mean, the story is very much about that third country benefit that you that you've mentioned. I wonder, is that just a kind of a, a fleeting, fleeting kind of anecdote of like a, a, a one individual or, 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 you know, is there something about these programs that can be supportive for people who maybe you know, don't have documents or have the wrong documents for the wrong state. Um, I know that Henley and Partners also has the, the citizenship review and they sort of like push this framework of global citizenship and refugees and, you know, um, is there is there a kind of humanitarian bent, a kind of the possibility for um, not the super ultra wealthy to also benefit from these programs? Yeah, that is really interesting. I think with the Middle East, I mean, it's also such a complicated situation because, um, there's so many different countries with different geopolitical or similar ones of different, you know, geopolitical challenges and Dubai and maybe a little bit um, Lebanon, although much less in, you know, also I suppose Istanbul, but you know, especially Dubai is such a hub. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but as, as you know, <laughs> you know all, all too well. um, and so, and that thing of, you know, especially in Dubai, you need a passport to put your document in. If you don't have a passport to put your your visa, you, you can't you can't get a visa unless it's in a passport. And I did encounter, um, usually in in especially in um, interviews with service providers um, in Dubai, this was pretty common. Um, so it wasn't super wealthy oligarchs. It was successful in business. I mean, you do have to have about a hundred thousand, but. Um, you know, some, you know, like, it, it, but it can't, but, but not, also not that rich people who, you know, it's sort of like, I want my, you know, especially if they don't have papers for all these different geopolitical reasons and the Rentier state, you know, wanting, not wanting to extend its welfare benefits to, to everybody in the country um, that, you know, if your child wants to go abroad for university, your child might have to get a passport. Um, you, you know, if they're if if they don't have documents, you, you know, and you, you you know better than anybody else about the you know the stateless and undocumented issue, and and in those cases, or, or Palestinians is another um, population where getting a passport, even if it's not your own, um, really changes life opportunities for people in terms of of travel, um, and so I think definitely, and and you don't see it in the same way in China. In China, you get many more people who get it and put it in the safety deposit box. And it's like a just in case, um, you, you know, we're, you know, maybe it never comes out of that, but they just kind of don't know what's going to happen. And you, you might as well, just in case. Russia also, you know, regime that's been, you know, sort of in and out and all of this, just in case. Um, and also Russia with, you know, the geopolitics of, you know, um, flying to London, people would say, it's so hard to fly to London on a Russian passport now, just because the geopolitical tensions are so tight. Um, so, yeah, but the middle, yeah, the Middle East, is, and and especially since it used to be, you, you know, these pass traveling on an Iranian passport in the 1970s was not an issue. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. and I, I mean, I think that that's where the temporal, like, certain moments in time create these, these mm -hmm. kind of um, critical junctures, right, that make mobility um, mm -hmm. more or less uh, likely for you. Um, any last words? We're, we're basically out of time and we answered all the questions, which is great. Um, I, I just want to give you the floor in case there's any kind of thing you want to take home message you want us to have from the presentation. <laughs> well, this, this has been great for me. It's been a while since I've, you know, I've been so swamped with teaching. It's been a while since I got to think about this and it made me excited uh, to get back into finishing the book now. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed the opportunity and I hope that we all have a chance to reconnect in the real world at some point soon. So thank you for all our attendees for being here. Um, and please join us next week. We have another one of these. And I think that um, we're going to put the poster now for the, for the next session. So um, uh, Professor Sirak, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I look forward to reading the book.